as you've heard from the presentations and particularly from this last presentation, from its very inception, Globe Ethics Net has seen one of its main objectives in promoting access to information and underlining the fundamental right of all people to have access to information and to make themselves heard. This principle is one that's upheld by the international community. And it's no coincidence that this gathering is taking place on the 10th of December. For this principle is one that is upheld by the international community in Article 19 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights we mark today. This states that everyone has the right of freedom of opinion and expression. This right includes freedom to hold opinions without interference and to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas through any media and regardless of frontiers. But what does this mean in practice? What challenges do we face today in seeking to uphold access to information as a human right? Our panelists today will help us reflect on this question. Um, on my right, on your left, is Ingrid uh, Del Tenwe, uh, the Director General of the European Broadcasting Union, our neighbour across the road here in Geneva since 2010. The European Broadcasting Union is the world's leading alliance of public service media, with I think 73 members in 56 countries across Europe and beyond. The EBU, more widely known to some as Eurovision, uh, holds that public service media is a cornerstone of democratic society and describes itself as an us its authoritative voice. Ingrid is a Swiss and Dutch national. Uh, prior to joining the EBU, she was uh, chief executive officer of Schweizer Fernsehen, the leading public TV broadcaster in the German-speaking part, German part of Switzerland. Pritam Malor is a strategy and policy advisor in the corporate strategy division of the General Secretariat of the International Telecommunication Union and an expert in international internet-related public policy matters. Also one of our neighbours here in Geneva, the ITU is an international organisation within which governments and the private sector coordinate global telecom networks and services. One of the areas in which the ITU is involved is the review process on the 10th anniversary of the World Summit of the Information Society, a leading UN organized event in 2003 and 2005, for which Global Ethics Net produced the discussion paper, Ethics in the Information Society. Originally from India, uh, Pritam has been a key member of the ITU Secretariat at several major conferences and serves as Secretary of the ITU Council Working Group on International Internet-Related Public Policy Issues. Mariana Edgerston is a member of the Board of Directors of the World Association for Christian Communication, WAC, a non-governmental organization that builds on communication rights in order to promote social justice with its headquarters in Toronto, Canada. With WAC, Globe Ethics Net has produced this new book, which we launch here today, More or Less Equal, How Digital Platforms Can Help Advance Communication Rights. Mariana is from Sweden, is currently coordinator for media, web, social media, and regional communication at the World Council of Churches. Maybe our closest neighbor, in whose building we meet today, in November, Marianne was appointed the new Director of Communication for the WCC, a position she will take up in 2015. Since 2010, I think, Kenneth Matata has been Study Secretary for Lutheran Theology and Practice at the Lutheran World Federation, another organisation with which we share this building, and which gathers more than 144 churches in the Lutheran tradition, representing more than 72 million Christians in 79 countries. Originally from Zimbabwe, Kenneth has taught at the Institute for Intercultural Theology at Hermannsburg in Germany and at the University of KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa. His PhD thesis shows how the location of production of texts determines their socio-political, economic and theological orientation. And perhaps more importantly than any of that, he has training in mechanical science in automobile electrics. 
Thank you very much. And I will start by asking each of the panelists to give a short reflection on how to respond to this issue of uh, information as a human right from their perspective and that of their organizations, and then widen out the discussion. Ingrid, what does the issue of access to information as a human right mean for public broadcasters as they seek to respond to their public service obligation? Well, first of all, good afternoon to everybody. I'm really excited to be here and I want to thank the organizers and especially Christoph Stuckelberger for inviting me to this panel. I'm really very happy to be here. We know each other from the train. You would think uh, we, uh, we, come, we, we, we know each other, we knew each other much longer, but actually uh, we know each other by coming to Geneva. Sometimes on a very early Monday morning at six, we meet in the same tribe, and I still remember the first time where we started to talk about values, about ethics, about globe ethics, by the way, and we get out of the train, and I wanted to say goodbye, and said, well, I have to take a bus. Well, Christoph has to take a bus as well, so we found out we had to take the same bus, bus number five, so we get into bus number five, and I said, well, it's taking me a while, and it's taking me a while too in the bus, and then at the end, we realized that I just took the same bus, but just one bus stop longer, the next one. Uh, and and uh, since ever then, I think almost every Monday at 6 o'clock in the train, we say hello. Although I'm a little more tired than, than Christoph, apparently, because I need to sleep. <laughs> and Christoph starts to work, so that's the big difference between the two of us. But so once again, thank you very much for inviting me here. Knowledge is power, and information is knowledge. And information in the wrong hands is a powerful force um, for the good, but also for the evil. Why is the first battle in any attempt to overthrow a government about taking control of the media? Think just recently about Crimea. Think what happens in Ukraine. Think what happened in the Arab Spring. Let's say it started in Tunisia, but it went all over the place. Uh, the level of editorial independence, as we have found out, the level of editorial independence of media is a very strong indicator for the quality of the democratic institutions and for the democracy itself in the country. And of course, access to information is a human right, as we know, but let it be accurate, timely, and balanced. Because if that information is not impartial, then it is a weapon that can also be turned against the people. And we have seen that often enough for sure. And that is perhaps why I'm here, again, as the Director General of the European Broadcasting Union, or Eurovision, as you might know better. I'd like to tell you about the values and the remit and the campaigns also we are actually supporting uh, to support public service media and their organizations. The beating heart of public service media and their remit, and here I will quote a, uh, a very appreciated godfather, let's say, of the media industry as well. It's Lord Reith, he was the one of the uh, former director generals of the BBC, who put this into three very simple words. Uh, public service media is about to inform, to educate, and to entertain. And these three words are as accurate as they have been some 90 years ago. The media today are replacing the market square uh, of the centuries before. Think about this beautiful square in Siena, or other beautiful market squares. This is today replaced to a certain extent by the media and definitely by the internet. That was the place where people were exchanging information and were also entertained. That happens now in the media and in the internet. And I think the internet is probably the strongest force today for democracy. And Globe Ethics, I think, is a very good example of, this, of the force of the internet of connecting people for the good. But not everything is true, what is distributed, and we see a lot of false information in the internet. And this is why we believe, of course, that we cannot depend on blogs and social media only. We, below, we, we really um, know that in a democratic and pluralistic society, you need to have the media that continue to verify, to add context, and to contribute to a pluralistic but also inclusive society. And this is what we do, and this is what, of, what we wanted also to share with our members and also to actually make an effort 
in contributing to this overarching goal. And this is why we have developed, and I, uh, we have discussed this in one of our train rides as well, uh, and I was very much encouraged also by Christoph to talk about values and to say, well, what actually is it that connects us, that connects public service media also in the world? Because we have quite a different, we have quite different members. Our membership reaches from, let's say, from, from Iceland uh, up to Morocco, Algeria, uh, Tunisia. It goes up to Azerbaijan. It includes also Israel. It includes, uh, it includes uh, Russia and Turkey. So they're all members of our association. We say, well, at the end of the day, we should strive to a set of values that really make public service media distinctive from others. And we managed, really, in 2012 to, to, um, to adopt in our General Assembly a set of values. Values such as universality, diversity, inclusiveness, independence, excellence, and iteration. And we explained those values, and they really, we say this is what public service media at the end should strive and should stand for. And we have developed a whole program to implement those values with regard to training journalists, training, uh, training journalists about the values, uh, but also um, helping our members in their countries to sort of make a step towards uh, independence. And that is why we interfere quite often now at the political level also to support the membership. That is one of my main tasks in the organization. But uh, again, uh, those values are, are just the beginning. We have to live up to them. And this is why I believe that we are maybe, uh, in, in, in this respect, very similar to the Globe Ethics Network. It's a continuous, it's a continuous work. It never stops. We have to defend them and we have to prove them every day. And this is, I think, what the EBU is supposed to do. And we only can do this, of course, if there is also a society that actually um, 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 wants this, is prepared for this, and, and also supports this. Uh, so it's all about information. It's all vital for the well-being of a civilized society, we believe. I think it needs treated with great care, and it needs to be defended every day. And this is, I think, what brings us uh, together, and this is probably why I'm here on this panel. Thank you. And uh, first of all, uh, please accept my congratulations on your 10th uh, mm -hmm. uh, birthday. Uh, for those who may not know about ITU, uh, we are very close by. Uh, Dr. Brown already explained that uh, we are uh, a UN agency, an international organization, but uh, many may not know that we are the oldest UN agency. Uh, we also have a birthday coming up, which is our 150th birthday uh, next year. So, of course, you're all invited. Uh, and. Uh, we are the UN specialized agency for information and communication technologies, uh, commonly known as ICTs. Uh, what do we do? We allocate global uh, radio spectrum, satellite orbits. We define the technical standards which ensure that your network and your technology seamlessly interconnect. Uh, and of course, uh, as a UN agency, we strive to uh, improve access to ICTs to the underserved communities across the world. And. Uh, uh, you already mentioned this, so I'll quickly run through this. Uh, we have 193 member states, but we also have uh, around 700 uh, sector members, which include uh, some of the largest tech companies in the world, and uh, many civil society organizations working on issues such as accessibility uh, for people with uh, disabilities, uh, issues uh, such as uh, uh, easy access to spectrum, uh, many, many different issues, gender issues, uh, uh, and uh, of course, we also have a uh, count among our members, universities across the world. Uh, so we, we are a very diverse organization, and uh, uh, we all come together and uh, uh, formulate, uh, help discuss topics, sometimes formulate policies, usually by consensus. And uh, now I'll quickly get to the theme of today's discussions, which is access to information as a human right. Uh, Obviously, uh, seeking information, receiving information is a fundamental human right, and it's codified in the Article 19 of the Universal uh, Declaration of Human Rights. You also have Article 90 or 19 of the ICCPR, which is a follow-up in 64, I think. And uh, Dr. Brown already read the para, the essential para, which talks about freedom of expression, freedom of uh, opinion, of uh, uh, right to hold uh, opinions without interference. Uh, in all this, the key aspect is communication, which is the fundamental social process 
in achieving all this. And that's where our mandate comes. Uh, the ITU's mandate uh, does not include discussions on freedom of expression, on uh, freedom of opinion. Of course, it's, it's always in our, uh, uh, at the back of our mind. But our core uh, mandate is to ensure and promote access to the means of communication. That's what we do, and so that's that's the essence of my talk today. Um, of course, we work very closely with the Human Rights Council, with UNESCO, with all other UN agencies whose, under whose code mandate some of these issues fall. So uh, I'll, I'll just address the issues that we deal with and, and give a broader perspective uh, probably at the end. Uh, it's, it's obvious, um, Ingrid also mentioned that ICTs are becoming an integral part of our life. Uh, it has a tremendous impact on socio-economic development aspects of modern society. This is all obvious. Uh, it's not just a mean for communication, it also opens doors to enormous and uh, easily accessible means for information and provides tremendous opportunities for all. Uh, I come from India and, and uh, ICTs essentially change the entire landscape of our country. So uh, I, I speak from experience here. Uh, uh, access to information, of course, is an essential part of the personal and professional development of individuals uh, and also essential in exercising their fundamental rights such as the right to education, the right to freedom of expression. And as we progress uh, towards defining the post-2015 development agenda, uh, which is going to be the core focus of uh, most UN agencies, uh, uh, the process is already on, but it's going to culminate next year in New York, uh, we should remember to retain the focus on our common uh, uh, desire and commitment to build a people-centric, inclusive and development-oriented uh, information society where everyone can create, access, use, and share information and knowledge. And then this principle essentially came out from the, uh, the World Summit on Information Society in 2005. And this principle holds as much true today as it held in 2005. Uh, and it's obvious the internet is one of the greatest tools uh, uh, that we have. Many different players, including the technical communities, the academic communities, civil society, are all to be commended for actually coming up with this tool for the contribution and collaboration and its creation and its development. And uh, the world is getting increasingly digitalized. And uh, here, the right to seek and receive inf information is almost the same as uh, a right to access to ICTs. And uh, the number of internet users are growing um, globally. Uh, we have around 3 billion users right now. Two thirds of the world's internet users are from the developing countries. Uh, I think just China and India put together is around eight, 900 mil, uh, million, or probably a billion, close to a billion, I think, just in terms of number of internet users. And uh, it's going to double uh, or grow exponentially in the coming years. It's a public good. I mean, uh, let's all acknowledge that internet is a public good. But it's still far from ubiquitous because you still have 4.4 billion people who are not online, who don't have access to the internet. And this includes two thirds of the people from developing countries. And it's also important to recognize that even those who are not online, uh, th even those who are online, don't always have the same access to the same knowledge and opportunities. And uh, um, just some examples of reasons uh, why this may be. One, of course, the main one is affordability. Uh, where there's a significant uh, gap in, for example, prices in mobile broadband uh, between developing and developed countries. Uh, in 2013, for example, the transit rates were a few dollars uh, per uh, Mbps, which is the uh, megabits per second, in many, country, many cities in the developed world whereas you had to pay more than uh, $1,000 per Mbps in some Pacific Island countries. Enormous, enormous difference. The second reason could be the availability of services that one takes for granted in developed countries. Social media, apps, many e-commerce platforms, those are not available at all in developing countries, just because maybe the speed doesn't support that. Uh, the third is, which, which is an important one, uh, services are not being offered in the local language of many countries because the size of the market may not justify that uh, because it requ requires a lot of investment to localize uh, technology and it requires uh, a lot of effort and it may just not be worth it for the private sector. Uh, it could also be that these services, applications, may not be designed for uh, persons with disability to enjoy full access to these online resources or on an equal basis uh, with others. So we need to ensure that all people 
especially the most disadvantaged, have equitable access to this vital resource uh, to ensure sustainable social and economic development. And I would argue that uh, along with having equitable access to services, it's also important that all stakeholders from all nations have meaningful, meaningful access to participation in the international discussions and the decision-making processes. Uh, the internet, uh, it's, it's acknowledged that it's, it's generally open, interoperable, and unified. But the unification should, uh, the unified connectivity should not uh, just mean uh, your overarching uh, unification of all diverse views of customs, cultures, traditions, but it actually should mean fostering and celebrating this diversity by enabling a diversity of content, platforms, applications, online services, communication tools, uh, which will create, therefore, a demand for more of these, more, more network, more services, and also allow your users to fully benefit from uh, what's being offered by the internet. Uh, I'll end my address with this, and uh, again, I thank you all for this opportunity, and I look forward to the deliberation. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. It's an honor to be here today. And I have followed you during the last 10 years. And I really hope I could follow you the next coming, maybe 50 years. I'm 44 years old. Mm -hmm. I will talk about communication for all. It's all about dignity, humanity, solidarity, and love. The Christian tradition affirms that God invests all of humankind with freedom and dignity and that God stands especially with the oppressed and marginalized, working through history for their liberation. God desires that all people be enabled to learn from and interpret their own reality. The World Association for Christian Communication, VAC, promotes communication for social change. We believe that communication is a basic human right that defines people's common humanity strengthen cultures, enable participation, and creates community. VEC key concerns are media diversity, equal and affordable access to communication and knowledge, media and gender justice, and the relationship between communication and power. It tackles these through advocacy, training, education, in creation and sharing of knowledge. Believing that communication embodies respect for the dignity, integrity, equality, and freedom of all human rights and being their communities, VAC recognizes communication rights as a part of all other human rights. Communication rights claim spaces and resources in the public sphere for everyone to be able to engage in transparent, informed and democratic debates. They claim unfettered access to the information and knowledge essential to democracy, empowerment, responsible citizenship, and mutual accountability. Communication for all affirms the centrality of communication, including mass communication and social media, in strengthening human dignity and in promoting democratic values and social justice. In particular, the principle of communication for all, restore voice and visibility to vulnerable and disadvantaged groups in a spirit of genuine solidarity. Communication promotes freedom and demands accountability in many communities and in the com incorporation of emerging communication technologies into daily life multiple voices while creating spaces where those who have been silenced and made invisible may address grievance. The existence of information and communication technologies on its own does nothing and not guarantee access to everyone. In today's world, communication must be lifted up as a fundamental right and communicators call to practice an ethics of freedom and accountability. Freedom of expression must be respected and community groups assured access to technology and to media platforms. The media's role in society includes acting as a watchdog of governments 
and, and changing the free flow of information to the public. This function can be undermined not only by government secrecy, which denies the media access to information on matters of public interests, but also by laws which unduly restrict freedom of expression. In 1948, the United Nations General Assembly adopted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, especially in Article 19, as Dr. Brown mentioned in the beginning. Everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression. This right includes freedom to hold opinions without interference and to seek, receive, and impact information and ideas through any media and regardless of frontiers. So communication for all. Let us mobilize once more. We are able to act. It does not take more than one to tell the truth. It has happened before. Remember, you and I can change the world. Remember Nelson Mandela, Gandhi, Martin Luther King, and Malala. And I would like to also add Christopher Stickelberg. <laughs> you and I can promote a change together. We should dare to stand up for injustice and dare to protest against it. It is our responsibility and our task as human beings. You can contribute with your gifts and I with mine. Together we are strong. Let, this, let us do it now. And communication for life, that's the catchphrase of the day. Thank you very much, Dr. Brown. I want to extend uh, my uh, best wishes uh, for Globe Ethics uh, on this 10th uh, 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 anniversary. Um, my, my son will be turning 10 in the next two months. And uh, there are three elements that I have started to observe with him, which I think could uh, describe the context in which Globe Ethics at its 10th anniversary finds itself. First. He seems to be overwhelmed with information. Uh, there is a lot uh, of uh, questions that he is raising as a result. And I think this is an important context for us to think about uh, those who are working with information. We are living in a situation where there is extreme production of, of information. In the past, it was only human beings who were producing information. Today, we are living at a time when also machines are producing information. The second thing that I see from my son is that he's also developing patterns of consumption of information. There are certain things that he's interested in on TV and uh, on the internet. And uh, I also uh, think that it is important for us to realize that uh, there are obviously uh, social indicators of uh, different kinds of appetites for certain types of information. Unfortunately, there is a growing uh, appetite for trivia, uh, for celebrity gossip, and for cheap talk. And that's why we are grateful uh, for uh, Globe uh, Ethics and uh, other similar organizations who are not only uh, allowing and relinquishing this uh, space for this kind of cons information, but they are also trying to provide alternative information whose uh, uh, a result could uh, contribute to, to well-being. I think the, sec the third uh, uh, context in which I, I see the, the growth of my son is the experience of ethical dilemma he finds himself when he looks at this information. Sometimes also we are confronted with this uh, a dilemma. Recently we were watching television and there was uh, a, 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 a terrible uh, situation of a uh, a man who was lying naked as a result of Ebola, and uh, everyone didn't know what to do with this man, and it was on television. And my wife was asking, should we switch off the television? We, we didn't know whether we were supposed to switch off the television or we were supposed to allow him to experience the reality of the, the world. And that is for him to experience the available information. But what, uh, for, for organizations like Globe Ethics and many others who are dealing with information, there are many uh, 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 ethical dilemmas to do uh, on one end, for example, uh, personal uh, 
privacy, uh, which is a right, uh, confronted with another right, which is access to information, for example, for purposes of security. This is the context in which I see uh, Globe uh, Ethics uh, working in this uh, 10th anniversary. But we can only say uh, access to information is a human right if we consider three factors, in my view. The first factor is the fact uh, that uh, information must be related to identifiable ends for sustainable life. Because if we are recognized that uh, there is so much information out there, there must be growing mobilization for consensus on that information which contributes to the well-being of the greater populations of the world. And I think this is an important point uh, because we can uh, also see that uh, uh, information uh, can easily become a tool for cultural domination, which we are seeing uh, right now. Even though my colleague here has, men has, has mentioned that uh, there is a greater use of uh, information on the internet, but there is little production of that information in the South. So you can see that there is a growing consumption of information that is produced in another part of the world. And this, uh, I don't think, is a, uh, a, an appropriate environment or, or context in which uh, information can be considered a human right. There is a second, I think, issue that I think we need to consider if information access is considered as a right. It must be related to equitable opportunities for not only for production but also for distribution. Uh, I think this has already been mentioned, and I think this is one area in which we must commend the work that Globe Ethics is doing, because what Globe Ethics has done is not only to uh, make sure that uh, there is an increase open access, but also that there is an increase uh, development of capacities for people from other parts of the world to produce information and to have their information accessed. I think this is a quite a nuanced uh, process uh, which uh, uh, may not be easily uh, identified as a contribution, but I think this is an important uh, resource. Lastly, I would think that uh, information access should be considered as a right if this access should be transcended by use that leads to economic inclusion. I think there is a lot of talk about access to, to information, but I think uh, this uh, should be the beginning. I think the aim should be information use, because it is only important when access has been translated to use, because only in use can it become a tool for economic emancipation. People can have as much uh, uh, access to information. I, I was uh, laughing with a friend who was uh, telling me uh, uh, recently in a village, people were given access to, uh, to the internet and uh, they, they spent most of their time uh, uh, watching uh, movies. Many of them had never seen a movie. And uh, they, they left uh, their uh, responsibility in the fields and they were enjoying watching this new experience. I think access to information can only become a right when information that is provided is contextualized on one end, and this contextualization leads to economic empowerment. And this is very possible. We are seeing it happening. Globe Ethics is doing this. And I think this can be done when this information enables local people to use this information for economic production. With these uh, few words, I again wants to wish, want to wish you a uh, happy birthday. I've got a question to Ingrid, and uh, maybe this is rather an unfair question because you're the person on a panel who comes from the European Broadcasting Union, um, whereas our other three panelists come from international or global organizations. And my question really to the EBU then is taking up the challenge um, from Ken about seeing uh, the global production of information. Um, how does the European Broadcasting Union see itself within this, this global sphere, both in terms of, of giving and for sharing information, but also uh, receiving and distributing from other parts of the world? 
I see that you don't see us as an international organization. Uh, that's already a strong signal. The European single market has apparently uh, become a reality. No, but uh, there are two, probably two aspects, and I agree uh, when it comes to um, there, who is producing what and who shares what and who distributes what. I think there are definitely, uh, uh, there is a certain dominance, and I think this soft power of policy has been uh, has been a strong aspect in the foreign policy affair, in the foreign uh, foreign affairs policies of big uh, continents and big powers such as the United States uh, to a certain extent uh, also to the European let's say mainly the British uh, and it has become now also a tool for let's say um, some um, emir smaller emirates such as uh, Qatar for example that have recognized that with uh, strong channels such as Al Jazeera, strong um, uh, production with regard to soap operas uh, by acquiring uh, expensive sports rights that they have a say and that they can spread a couple of messages. I think that is definitely definitely the case. If you look into who is producing most of the uh, movies that uh, are watched worldwide, it's definitely the Hollywood studios, although India has uh, quite a, a range to offer as well. But they don't, it, it's one way sort of, it's the US basically being able to, to distribute their content to other continents and other continents struggle actually to get their content back to the US. That's a fact. Uh, what are we doing as a European Broadcasting Union? Well, first of all, I think the union was established um, exactly because of this reason. It was established before really television was going on air. And one of the core fundamental ideas of the union was to actually share, to produce together, to work together, to actually have content also that can be exchanged. And uh, this is why, for the time being, we operate a news exchange. We are a very large news agency, probably the largest in the world. We share about 150 news items for television uh, per day. That makes us probably producing or contributing to 80% of foreign coverage of every European channel, um, be it the BBC or be it the ARD, ZDF, or Swiss Television, or Rai, or France Television. That is exchanged and is content produced by us. Uh, second, we operate the biggest, let's say, concert hall by exchanging more than 4,000 concerts that have been uh, produced by our members, by their orchestras, but we, we actually manage a lot of music rights, music rights from orchestras and composers that are of European origin, and this exchange is actually also very widely distributed to the Asia-Pacific and also to the US. And, of course, we work together in co-productions. The most famous one is the Eurovision Song Contest, but we do a lot, lot more. So we, this is one of the fundamental ideas, is really to put our money together, uh, to, to produce together wherever possible, but also to share what we produce. So, uh, and the aim of this is, of course, to make sure that there is a high level of own production and, and own quality production, I must say, in, in the European territories, which, of course, is quite ambitious because you have lots, only in Europe you probably will have roughly 100 languages that are, are spoken and, and the language barrier is definitely something that doesn't help us. Um, and uh, we work closely together with our sister unions and there is a sister union um, for the Asia Pacific, there is a sister union in, in, uh, in the Arabic speaking region, ASPO. Uh, which is currently its assembly. And of course, there is also an African um, uh, broadcasting union, which is uh, comparably poor to other members. There's not a lot of money actually they have available, which makes it very difficult for us to work with them. Uh, but we try. So we try to help them to build their own network, uh, to exchange and to actually facilitate co-production within the regions uh, and try to inspire them by models that we have learned uh, amongst our members that work very well. Thank you. Marianne, do you have a comment to that? I have a question. I don't know if I'm allowed yes, to. Yes, of course. Thank it's you. A, it's your, it's a human rights of access exactly. to questions. Yeah. <laughs> because of that, I asked you. Uh, thank you very much, Ingrid, for your presentation. You mentioned in the beginning that you adopted a document, Values 2002, and you are trying to implement them and you are defending them almost every day. And when you are dreaming about the future, what's next step in your role? 
according to the values. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the, fund, well the, fundamental, the vision of the European broadcasting is really to make public service media indispensable. And we do this on three pillars. One is really exchanging programs. Second one is really be a hub, uh, an inspirational hub of learning and sharing. And the third one is actually to, to, do a, to provide active lobbying, but also training facilities. And what we did is when we created the values in 2012, we had really everybody Algeria, Morocco, Azerbaijan, Russia, and also Turkey adopting the values and saying, we know we are not perfect, we know we are far from being perfect, but actually we think if we really want to make a difference as public broadcasters, serving the society, serving the public, and not the government or any other, we have to strive for these values. And what we're now doing is we have a so-called peer-to-peer review, because one thing is to say we adhere to these values, and we have those are our values, but the other thing is, of course, you have to deliver uh, it's easy to say that you live and, and you accept those values, but you, uh, how do you measure if you deliver to those and live up to these values? And what we have established is a peer-to-peer -peer review. So what we do is we, that six values are our fundamentals. And uh, so our members, it's still on a mandatory phase. It's, it's, uh, it's not mandatory yet, actually. It is really, uh, it is, it's, not, 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 uh, it's, man, it's not mandatory yet, but we hope we get it that far is that the, the members basically make a self-appraisal, self-assessment, how they contribute to the values, the quality about their contribution to these values, and then we send in a team of peers, usually it's high level, it's director generals, that level, that go, read of course the self-appraisal, and actually check and have interviews with the staff, with some citizens or representatives of this society, and actually make recommendations on what they think they do really well, but what probably the level of improvement still is. And by doing this and rolling this out one by one, uh, we've just finished one in Czech Republic, we are doing one in Switzerland, Wiley from Finland has committed, Swedish radio and television will be next year, 2015. Uh, so we have probably some 12 members now doing this or have done it already. And the aim is, of course, that uh, within the next four or five years, all 40, 74 members will have actually done such a peer-to-peer -peer review, which, of course, has a value in itself. Uh, not only the member profit has a profit and a benefit, but also the peers that learn. And with this, we try to sort of increase the level uh, of, of the contribution to society. Any other comments, questions from the panel? I've got a question for, um, for Pritam. Um, on my, yeah, my left-hand side, um, Marianne uh, was talking about the role of a civil society organization like WAC in terms of promoting communication for all and promoting communication rights. And my question to you as someone from the ITU is, how can civil society organizations like uh, WAC uh, work most effectively with the ITU to promote the objectives that you outlined in your contribution? Sure. Uh, I'll answer your question in two parts. First, I'll talk about the role of civil society, the roles and responsibilities of different stakeholders. And the second part would be how you can uh, contribute. And the second part is very easy. Okay. So, uh, the the main debate which has been happening uh, prior to this is the, the World Summit on Information Society. And this World Summit on Information Society was this uh, huge conference. I think uh, there were, it was held in two phases with 19,000 people, one night, 19,000 people, uh, from all stakeholder groups participating. And they came up with this uh, set of rules on how the information society should be structured, should progress on different, different topics, uh, including capacity building, on cyber security, on e-applications, and also on ethics. Uh, ethics it, it, they structured it in the form of silos, action lines. Uh, of, of course, there is a cross-pollination between them. Uh, ethics is the one which uh, UNESCO kind of facilitates. But anyway, another thing they came up with was this multi-stakeholder model of the governance of the internet. What it means is that there are different stakeholders, and each stakeholder has its own roles and responsibilities. So for example, uh, governments. 
what the summit outcome document said was governments have the primary responsibility on public policy matters because they're answerable to their citizens. Uh, private sector is primarily responsible for uh, the investments, the infrastructure, new developments, R&D. Uh, the third category would be the uh, intergovernmental organizations like the ITU, like UNESCO, like many other non-UN agencies also. Our role is in facilitating the uh, kind of the uh, discussions, global discussions on public policy issues, anything with uh, global ramifications. We also had uh, international organizations, not really intergovernmental, but international organizations who are responsible for, uh, uh, for example, technical standards, which are purely managed by them. Uh, and then you had the civil society organization. And the role of the civil society organizations, as uh, laid out by the summit, uh, was uh, working at the grassroots level, bringing the feedback from the grassroots level to your government, to the international organizations, to all other stakeholder groups, and making sure that they listen. And uh, we also had the... Uh, uh, academic organizations, you have the technical community, of course, who work within this. So th this is the model which was laid out. Uh, and uh, the ITU, in the ITU, it's fairly straightforward. You can contribute to, uh, as a civil society organization, you can contribute to our work in many different ways. One is obviously, if you're an international civil society organization with an interest in, uh, uh, in uh, telecom policy and information communication technologies, you can actually become a member of ITU. Uh, as I had mentioned, there are many civil society organizations working on disability issues, on gender issues, on youth issues, who are members of ITU. And in fact, you can also ask for a fee waiver and our council usually approves that. So this is a very easy way to do that. Second is, except for our decision-making processes, our council, our plenipotentiary, most of the other processes are open to any stakeholder group. So for example, uh, I know Globe Ethics uh, actively participated in the VISIS process mm -hmm. and also in the annual VISIS forum that we mm -hmm. organize, ITU, UNCTAD, and a few other UN agencies organizes. And it's an annual event. It's a, it's a follow-up of the implementation of the summit. And it happens usually in uh, May, June, every year, uh, where uh, you can come, you can usually around 2,000 uh, stakeholders turn up, and you can come, you can organize an event, you can talk to other stakeholders, and you can actually participate in the ITU uh, processes in that way. There are many other ones, uh, but this, this is the primary one. And uh, in fact, there are others which are organized by uh, the UN, such as the Internet Governance Forum. There are many others. Uh, and I invite you to take advantage of these. You can just go to our website or just write me an email. As you may know, uh, the Lutheran World Federation in uh, 2017 will be commemorating 500 years uh, of the Reformation. Uh, the Reformation, the spread of the Reformation uh, was uh, one result of uh, the development of communication technology, the change in the communication technology, the, the development of the print uh, media. And uh, we this uh, uh, is, uh, is recognized in the LWF as an important uh, uh, component uh, to think about as we are commemorating the Reformation. Two weeks ago, uh, the, the Lutheran World Federation was uh, running training programs for, for, for Lutheran, for communicators, uh, particularly in, uh, in Africa. There are several communication uh, um, centers uh, in, uh, in Africa, some related to the use of radio. Um, uh, you will realize that uh, in some, some countries like uh, Tanzania, like uh, Ethiopia, the churches are some of the providers of, uh, of uh, access uh, to information uh, through the use of uh, radios in the, in the rural areas. So they were running a training program just to in, um, strengthen the capacity of communicators in those, in those regions. And I, I, I think this is one way to contribute to, uh, to reducing this uh, divide. Um, uh, because um, you'll find that many of the, the people in this part of the world uh, may, may have uh, uh, a an knowledge uh, of how to communicate uh, locally, but uh, uh, they are not. Uh, able to do what uh, organizations in this part of the world are able to do, uh, not only to produce for local consumption, but also to produce for, 
for consumption in the other parts of the world. And I think this is still a, a deficiency which uh, uh, needs to still to be to be fulfilled. Yes, I, uh, the, your remark about the uh, Reformation and prompts a slogan that I heard uh, mentioned the other day that someone said that the printing press was the social media of Martin Luther. Maybe um, that offers an opportunity to think about uh, the social media and, uh, and the Lutheran World Federation as it faces uh, 2017. Mariana, I've got a question for you. Um, we've heard... Uh, some of the challenges facing public uh, broadcasters and public service uh, media. I know that uh, the World Association for Christian Communication is a, a critical partner of, uh, of broadcasters and media um, in terms of how the public broadcasters and other broadcasting organizations um, represent uh, gender within, the, within their output. And uh, I wonder what your challenge would be on, on that to the uh, public service broadcasters in terms of an equitable access uh, to information. Thank you very much, Dr. Brown, for that challenge. I would say this is a very good opportunity to getting together the panel that I'm representing a non-governmental organization working for gender justice. That's one important area. And I'm very glad that Ingrid mentioned that you are working on your values, that it's very helpful in that sense, because we have to work much more for a justice world, gender-based productions. And we could do much more, I think, and that we could do that together. So I will also take up the challenge from Prison that we will follow your work and try to connect different organizations, associations, companies, and work together to strengthen the, the role of the women and men in the media. Yes. In fact, now that you mentioned it, I've I should have uh, brought that up. Uh, we are uh, now working a lot on uh, gender and uh, ICTs. In fact, we have a brand new program uh, uh, which, uh, which, for the first time, uh, ITU and uh, UN Women together uh, organized the, a GEMTECH Award, it is a Gender Equality and Mainstreaming Award, uh, in our uh, plenipotentiary conference in uh, Korea very recently. And this will be an annual award. Next year will be at the Beijing conference. And uh, th this, this will be one of the key focus areas of ITU. I think I would uh, say there is going to be uh, not uh, a multiplication or trebling, but uh, even increasing uh, number of uh, information producers there will be extreme volumes of information, uh, but I think there should be few organizations like Globe Ethics that should continue to push for qualitative contribution to information and to ensure that information will contribute to well-being and to ensure that uh, this access to information will stimulate uh, economic participation for those who are on the margins. We need globetics. We need the way you are dealing with information, knowledge, and education. So let's work together much more in the future and share resources and knowledge. That would be my word of the day. And congratulations again on the anniversary. And keep up your good work. Um, you always have this struggle, this uh, need for a balance between ensuring security, especially in the online world, and ensuring privacy, ensuring freedom of expression, because you cannot really be free if you're not secure. And uh, you cannot be free if you cannot trust the information in front of you. Uh, but you should not also use that as an excuse to impose security which impinges on uh, uh, fundamental freedom. So there's always this delicate balance, and I think that's where Globe Ethics comes into the picture. Uh, it's an area which requires a lot of focus, the right kind of focus, and I think you can bring that to the team. Mm -hmm. 
there is a mot there is a saying uh, that says evil prevails when uh, good men fail to act. This is a saying that is for me probably my motto, if you would ask me for my motto. And I usually bring it also into companies. And I think Christoph Stuckelberger has very much acted in line of exactly this. He has acted. And I think you see there are a couple of very powerful organizations sitting here on your podium because of you, basically. You asked us to come here, and we are here because of you. And I think uh, to have good strategic partners and to set the common objective and to have the partners and you working together is probably a very powerful tool uh, to uh, strive at the end of the day for a better place to live. Thank you all very much. Um, it's, I would love to have been able to continue the discussion, but we do have the, the time constraints. Um, I'd like to uh, thank all of the panelists once again.